Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansi. Tonight, the extradition hearing for Meng Wanzhou is finally underway with so much at stake. The Crown's arguments for extradition. Today, the court links, connects the dots. The fate of imprisoned Canadians may hang in the balance as officials read between the lines of Michael Spavor's sentence. Once you get home, is there a, a chance, you know, to get home earlier? International travel is making a post-COVID comeback. We are working actively on a secure, pan-Canadian proof of vaccination for international travel. How it will work and when it will be ready. Why was an elderly Nova Scotia man left lying in his driveway waiting for an ambulance that never came? Are you kidding me? We called at four and it's seven and nobody's here yet? A celestial show in the sky tonight. Bob McDonald gets excited about the Perseid meteor shower. This is The National. In the long, sometimes bitter diplomatic dispute between Canada and China, with the fate of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou and three Canadians in the balance, this week could be pivotal. Yesterday, the focus was on a courtroom in China. Today, it turned to B.C. That's where Meng's extradition hearing finally got underway, two and a half years after she was arrested in Vancouver to be sent to the U.S. Wednesday morning in China, Canadian Michael Spavor was sentenced to 11 years behind bars and deportation. Spavor's arrest and that of fellow Canadian Michael Kovrig happened shortly after Meng's, widely seen as an act of retaliation. In the United States, Meng faces fraud charges for allegedly violating economic sanctions. Now Canada must decide if she should be sent there. Karen Pauls takes us through what happened today. Meng Wanzhou arrived at court today to hear the Crown's arguments in favour of extradition. Today, the court links, connects the dots between evidence and law and argument. Meng was arrested at Vancouver's airport in December 2018. She spent a week behind bars before being released on $10 million bail. Living under partial house arrest in a $14 million home, Meng has a curfew and is being tracked by a GPS ankle monitor and security guards. Her legal team maintains the arrest violated her rights and that she was used as a political pawn by then-President Donald Trump. But today, before a judge, the Crown argued this process has been fair and that there is evidence of fraud. It's not a trial. The bar for extradition is very low. The U.S. extradition request has worsened relations between Canada and China, which has repeatedly called for Meng's release. When Joe Biden was elected president, there was hope he would retract the extradition request, but he hasn't. Well, I think that the Americans are, well, clearly they're not keen to just drop it, um, having uh, invested a fair effort into preparing the case. Adding to the complexity, China's espionage cases against Canadians Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig. And we want our two Michaels back. It might be possible through negotiations between Washington and China to work out some kind of compromise arrangement, a plea deal perhaps. Meng's lawyers will begin their submissions on Friday. After that, the judge will either order her discharge or recommend that she be extradited to the United States to face trial. But that decision could still take months, and it ultimately rests in the hands of Canada's Justice Minister. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Vancouver. While that was happening in B.C., the federal government was speaking out in Ottawa, continuing to push for the release of Michael Spaver and Michael Kovrig. And as Evan Dyer shows us, some say the time has come to turn up the pressure. Welcome to the Southern Swedish Embassy. Stephanie Bader, Netherlands Embassy. Rasmus Bonds, Spanish Embassy. Diplomats from 25 countries showed support at Canada's embassy as Michael Spavor learned his fate. Today, China's embassy in Ottawa accused Canada of forming gangs to put pressure on the Chinese side and claimed it was completely futile. Canadian Ambassador Dominic Barton said Canadian officials are still trying to understand Spavor's sentence. 11 years and deportation, he wants to get home. Is there a, a chance, you know, to get home earlier? China sentenced Canadian Kevin Garrett to eight years with deportation in 2016. Deportation would normally occur only after the sentence is served. Within 36 hours, I was deported. So my hope for Michael is that the same would happen because the 
The Chinese government can deport him at any time. Former Canadian Ambassador Guy Saint-Jacques was closely involved in that case. Of course, at that time, we were able to get him deported the day after his uh, sentencing. In this case, clearly, it's a message from China that uh, if you don't do anything, this guy will spend 11 years in, uh, in jail. Mr. Trudeau has been offside with respect to China for six years. With an election looming, conservatives are calling on the Trudeau government to boycott next year's Winter Olympics in Beijing. Saint-Jacques agreed, saying Canada shouldn't lend itself to another Chinese propaganda effort like the one in 2008. And Canada and the U.S., after speaking with allies to get as much support as possible, should announce that Canada and the U.S. will jointly offer to host the next Winter Olympics. I think what we're missing, and the opposition is pushing on, is what is our policy towards China? Some say assembling allies for symbolic displays only goes so far. And I think we need to see the kind of policy the Europeans are coming up with, the, the come up with, the Americans are now looking at it. We should be doing this. Last month, the European Parliament voted for a new policy on China, including a bigger pushback against Chinese government disinformation and an attempt to ensure that Europe is not dependent on China in areas like trade, technology and defense. And it also includes a plan to negotiate a new investment agreement with Taiwan. And so how is China reacting? Well, China really doesn't like the last part, Ian, the part about Taiwan. In fact, the Lithuanian ambassador to China was at the Canadian embassy to show support for Michael Spavor, but he was told today to leave China, and that's because his country has allowed Taiwan to open what's basically an embassy there. But certainly across Europe, we're seeing a strategic rethink about China and a much more systematic pushback. Thanks, Evan. Thanks, Ian. Let's turn now to the pandemic and Canada's vaccine rollout. Currently, just over 71 percent of people aged 12 and up have been fully vaccinated. Nearly 82 percent have had at least one dose. That is among the highest rates in the world. And with that vaccine protection, more and more Canadians are considering traveling abroad. But how do they prove they've had their shots? Well, today, the federal government said it's working on a plan. Rafi Bujikanian has the details. From France to Quebec. But we will also use the vaccination passport. Documents showing proof of COVID-19 vaccinations are becoming more common. And now Ottawa is providing some detail about a planned vaccine passport for international travel. They will include the holder's COVID-19 vaccination history, including the vaccine types, date and location. The federal government says it is collaborating with provinces and territories to create a standard document for all Canadians, though it offered no clarity on exactly when it would be rolled out, other than early fall. We do have a timeline, and that timeline is to move forward as quickly as possible. Part of the challenge, there is no international consensus yet on what this kind of document could look like, though places such as Egypt have started their own initiatives. First, the citizen comes with a valid passport to make sure he and his jabs are registered in the system, whether one or two. Then a watermark is stamped, which cannot be forged. There are still many details that haven't been worked out. Different countries have different lists of approved vaccines. Hundreds of thousands of Canadians received AstraZeneca, which still hasn't been approved in the U.S. The Immigration Department says it's working with international partners to make sure the system works as smoothly as possible. Rafi Bujikani, CBC News, Ottawa. A Quebec City restaurant has started testing that province's new vaccination passport. It will be used to give fully vaccinated people access to public events, training facilities and bars. The biggest news for us is that we're sure with this passport that we won't close for a fourth time. The system uses a QR code to scan a customer's vaccination status. A gym in Laval will test it next week. The passport is set to launch on September the 1st. Fans of the NHL's Winnipeg Jets will be required to provide proof of full vaccination in order to attend the team's home games this upcoming season. Team officials say they plan to be at full capacity once games resume, but employees, event staff and guests will need to be vaccinated. Two more Canadian universities will require proof of vaccination this fall. The new policies at Western in London and the University of Toronto apply to all students, staff and faculty. Those without proof must be tested twice a week in order to be on campus.
And Quebec has become the latest province to unveil its back-to-school plan. It's looking to create a more normal classroom setting for the coming year. But as Sarah Levitt explains, some teachers and parents feel that's a problem. It's more like something looking like normal. School won't be exactly like it was before COVID, but something close to it. That means like Alberta, Quebec students in elementary and high schools will still have to wear masks, just not while seated in the classroom. Gone too are the classroom bubbles. We have to, to walk a narrow path between allowing um, the students to come back to a normal way of life and fighting this pandemic. So while sports and activities are back, vaccine passports will be required for high school students taking part in certain high-risk extracurricular activities. Critics, though, say the province is not responding to the threat posed by the more contagious Delta variant, particularly because those under 12 can't get vaccinated and remain vulnerable. We have no bubbles, we have no distancing between students, and uh, ventilation is still an issue. So yeah, I, 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 I'm very concerned. To tackle the issue of ventilation, Quebec says 90,000 carbon dioxide readers will be installed in all classrooms, but not before mid-December. The readers help detect poor indoor air quality and potential problems with ventilation. What I see is that, okay, we're going to put some detectors and it's going to be good for us in the long run. But for me, it's pressing. With a daughter in high school and another in elementary school, Clermont is worried. Premier François Legault, though, says there is no need for worry. It's secure. It's under control. Uh, there's no risk for our children, and it's not worse than anywhere else in the world. Still, Quebec's education minister says the safety of the students is first in his mind, and measures will be adjusted if the situation with the pandemic changes. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. So some experts say ventilation is key for sending Canadian kids back into classrooms. A little later in the program, we go in-depth. Every study that's been done uh, has shown that increasing ventilation is beneficial. The more ventilation, the, the less risk of infectious disease transmission. Ventilation 101, Joanna Romiliotis looks at how some school boards are clearing the air their students share. The air remains hazy in many parts of British Columbia tonight. At least two dozen wildfires are burning, and with a new heat warning, there are fears of new blazes erupting. Katie Nicholson has been talking to people in the province's interior who are trying to decide whether to stay or go. Rosie the dog paddles through the smoke-covered lake. She and owner Summer Brooks, part of a chaotic evacuation Friday night when wind whipped up the White Rock Lake fire. There's just drunk bachelorettes all over the streets at La Casa, and we've got headlamps on, no power, pitch black, packing up like the freezer. And the evacuation order for her area was rescinded, but it remains on alert. And Brooks isn't comfortable going back just yet. Some even question staying in the region long term. Like I can deal with two, three weeks of smoke a year, but like I can't do four months of smoke at 40 some degrees. We just washed all our bedding. And put it Other evacuees in. did return, albeit with one foot out the door. We're living out of a suitcase. Yeah, same here. I've left everything in the camper. We want to be ready if we have to leave again. You know, we don't want the chaos that we had last time. On Friday night, smoke plumed up and blanketed the area around Vernon. It rained soot, singed moss, needles and embers. Jane Agnew and Teresa Wittenberg's homes just south of the worst of it. <laughs> the power went out and then we got evacuated. So yeah, there was a lot of stumbling around in the dark and a lot of, you know, it, tensions were a little bit high. Yesterday, the province poured bucket after bucket of water over the problem area in the fire's northwest corner. But temperatures are now back up into the punishing 30s, which means that water can more easily evaporate to show you what firefighters in this region are up against all over this area. There are trees like this with this kind of brown, dry, dying stuff. It all falls to the floor. Down here you have ideal fuel for a fire. Today the wildfire service confirmed what some already knew. A half dozen structures now gone. They may be home for now, but... We might have to leave again and, you know, 
but it is what it is you know it's it's the new normal i think for because of all this uh global warming it's it's going to be like this for years not enough to drive some from the place they call home katie nicholson cbc news fintry bc Heat warnings are also blanketing much of southern Ontario. Several cooling stations have been set up in Toronto with air conditioning and water available for those in need. Extreme heat is expected to last into Friday with temperatures reaching the low 30s, but with the humid X, it'll feel closer to 40 degrees. Canada's Chief of Defence Staff, Art MacDonald, wants to return to that role after the military investigated an allegation of sexual misconduct and concluded no charges could be laid. But as Ashley Burke shows us, the government has other plans. Admiral Art McDonald held the military's top job for just a month. It is indeed an extraordinary privilege. Then stepped aside amid a sexual misconduct investigation. Now five months later, has decided to return to his command post immediately. But the defense minister says not so fast. Admiral McDonald uh, will remain on leave while we, while we review this situation. Here's the situation. On Friday, the military said McDonald would not face criminal charges because the evidence doesn't support that. This after a female junior officer came forward alleging an incident of sexual misconduct aboard a warship a decade ago. Today, McDonald's legal team released a statement saying now that he has been exonerated, it is appropriate for Admiral McDonald to return to his duties as CDS. Given that it was his decision to step aside, it is now his decision, indeed obligation, to return to his duties. But that decision isn't completely his. The chief of defense staff serves at the pleasure of the prime minister and can be dismissed at any time. The position of chief of defense staff must always uphold the highest standard uh, within the Canadian Armed Forces because of the responsibility that that position and the weight that, that it holds. The behavior of leaders like McDonald should clear a higher bar than not being criminal, say those who experience sexual trauma in the forces. That is not the standard Canadians or Canadian Forces members expect of their Chief of Defence staff. Uh, we expect much, much better. Others say leadership is a privilege. You know, I think that he doesn't really have the moral authority to lead the Canadian Forces at this moment in time. You know, it's a real watershed moment for the military. A watershed moment where those who report sexual misconduct want to be heard not dismissed. In a statement, the Privy Council office did say that public office holders are required to perform their duties in a manner above simply acting within the law. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Now to Afghanistan, a country that may be on the brink of total capture by the Taliban. In less than a week, day by excruciating day, extremist forces have seized control of nine provincial capitals. Kabul, the seat of the elected government, looks more and more like an island in a sea of occupied territory. The Taliban's advance was triggered by the withdrawal of Western troops 10 years after Canada ended its own combat mission in Afghanistan. Tonight, Carolyn Dunn shows us a country under siege. <laughs> Insurgents dragged the body of a man through the streets of what's believed to be the western Afghan city of Farah. A grisly scene playing out as the Taliban conquers provincial capitals at a dizzying rate. Thousands have fled to the Afghan capital to escape the violence. Our teams are out in the field in Kabul today trying to understand the needs and really have described to me that this is the worst situation that they've seen in Kabul ever. Afghan President Ashraf Ghani appeared today at a government stronghold to rally supporters and try to boost morale and release video of what he said was an airstrike on insurgents in Kandahar. But the Taliban is releasing its own video, like this one showing one of their fighters casually strolling through abandoned police and security headquarters. All this raises the inevitable question of whether it was worth the blood and treasure spilled in Canada's 13 years in Afghanistan. Canada's hope is that somehow at least some of its institution building will survive. We went into Afghanistan and Canadians very bravely paid a price for that. So our intentions were good intentions from the beginning. We hope that we will be able to continue to do so. 
any hope of a political solution is fading. The Taliban refuses to negotiate with the current president. Pakistan's prime minister says the Afghan government is desperate. They are now trying everything to somehow get the Americans back into Afghanistan. But that's a hard no from the U.S. They've got to fight for themselves, fight for their nation. Two-thirds of which has already fallen to the Taliban. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Washington. Emergency response times have become a major issue in Nova Scotia's election after one man waited for hours for an ambulance. Are you kidding me? We called at four and it's seven and nobody's here yet. Coming up, a hospital system in crisis. What's behind the province's unacceptable wait times? Plus, a Saskatchewan girl is blocked from playing on a co-ed hockey team. Grown men have just walked in on her because she's not actually in a dressing room. It's a utility closet. Why a changing room became a flashpoint for a human rights dispute. And a spectacular light show is happening overhead this week. It's a chance to see how fast the Earth moves through space. We'll tell you how you can catch the magic. We're back in two. Welcome back. Thousands of nurses took to the streets in Alberta today to demand the province drop its plans to roll back their salaries. The union says workers are exhausted and resources are stretched thin. They say the province's plan to cut their wages will lead to more hospital bed closures. The province is attempting to balance its finances in the wake of the turmoil from COVID. A Nova Scotia family is calling for change after waiting hours for an ambulance to help an 86-year-old man with a broken hip. As Shana Luck tells us, all of this happens in the middle of a provincial election campaign. This is where 86-year-old Ross O'Brien lay for three hours on Monday, waiting for an ambulance, while 911 dispatchers told his wife Janet not to move him. His daughter in the U.S. is outraged about the long wait. Are you kidding me? We called at four and it's seven and nobody's here yet. The family is especially upset because the O'Briens only live about five kilometres from Dartmouth General Hospital. But the ambulance dispatched to their home was from Parsborough, about 175 kilometres away. There's an 86-year-old man on the ground, injured and bleeding. And, you know, what, what is going on? This is not okay. Eventually, the police were called, and two officers took O'Brien to hospital in a police cruiser. Neither Nova Scotia Health or the private company that operates the ambulance service could explain why closer paramedics weren't dispatched, but in a joint statement, they said there's a high volume of calls right now. They wrote, the current situation is having an impact on patient access to care and patient flow across the province, particularly in the central zone. On the campaign trail, all three provincial party leaders agreed something needs to change. When we have these extraordinarily long ambulance wait times, what it is speaking about is a systemic crisis in health care as a whole. I was in another part of the province talking to uh, parents whose both of their sons are paramedics. They were in tears explaining to me the pressure that their sons and, and their colleagues are, are feeling because it should never be like this. It's unacceptable that someone would have to wait that long and uh, I have asked uh, through the Deputy Minister of Health uh, that, this, that we investigate this further and we ensure that something like this doesn't happen again. Ross O'Brien is now in hospital recovering from hip surgery and still waiting for answers about why he was left in pain with no help for so long. Shana Luck, CBC News, Halifax. It is just weeks before school begins and parents are worried their kids won't be safe. There's many schools that have not up-to-date ventilation. They have no windows. They have windows that don't open. Coming up, the scramble to make schools safe against disease. After weeks of summer with the kids, back to school can be magic words for parents. But it's a little different in a pandemic. With many COVID restrictions now lifted, a big part of reopening schools will be keeping children, especially those who are unvaccinated, safe indoors. Ventilation may be the key. Joanna Remiliotis now on how some school boards are meeting the challenge. The sun is still shining. Summer is not over yet. But a new school year is fast approaching, and with the return to class comes the return indoors. 
they all had the ventilation, right? That's correct. So what is going Tom to D'Amico is trying to ease any anxiety that comes with it. But what you're going to see in this building is most of the ceiling tiles have been removed. Mm -hmm. So the brand new uh, rooftop units will go on top. D'Amico is the Director of Education at the Ottawa Catholic School the Board. When the ceiling panels are back on, a new invisible layer of protection against COVID will be in place. This is new ductwork that's come in, being in place. Mm -hmm. So all of this ductwork will be con connected to the new units. The new units will bring fresh air in. The work to improve the air students will share started last year. In this one junior school alone, $600,000 has gone towards ventilation upgrades that will increase the amount of fresh air coming in. And to pay for unit ventilators with high-grade filters in portable classrooms. So it is a proven technique to prevent the spread. But also, as people know that we're increasing our filter exchanges, we have more fresh air being pumped into the schools at an earlier rate every day before students arrive to school. That's just going to help everyone's well-being, knowing that the chances are I can't be outdoors all the time. And when I'm indoor, uh, I've, the school and the school board has done a great job to mitigate that risk. The risk that COVID can spread through invisible particles in the air has always been there. Jeff Siegel was among the first in the world to warn about it. Siegel is an indoor air quality expert at the University of Toronto. The right way for everyone to think about this is this is a continuum. So it's not like, you know, right now we're about two meters apart. It's not like there's anything magic. The virus doesn't know that we're two meters apart. It's that the farther apart we are, the safer it is. And the fact that we're outdoors makes this enormously safer. And so, you know, we all have to be looking at this, and this is, you know, common for people like me. We live in a sea of risk, right? There's all these risks around us in indoor air, and now there's this risk of COVID too. And so everything we do with ventilation and filtration helps us um, uh, reduce that risk. The danger, he says, comes from tiny infected particles expelled by simply talking, particles that can travel indoors for longer distances. The first way we know that if you have low or poor ventilation, those particles by and large don't have anywhere to go. On the positive side, we know that the more we ventilate, the more we dilute the air with outside air. And I can't tell you like that increasing ventilation by 20% will reduce disease transmission by this amount. But what I can tell you is every study that's been done uh, has shown that increasing ventilation is beneficial. The more ventilation, the less risk of infectious disease transmission. The highly contagious Delta variant, the hundreds of thousands of unvaccinated children going back to school, has made the need to address indoor air even more urgent. The Toronto District School Board will encourage more outdoor learning while it spends $100 million upgrading schools' mechanical ventilation systems. But it's a complicated process. Maya Puchetti is head of facilities for the board. Hello. So this is one of our typical junior, senior kindergarten classrooms. And what you see here is a standalone institutional grade HEPA filter. At a recent media tour, Puchetti says while ventilation systems are improved, every classroom will have one of these units. Windows will also be kept open and unit ventilators will run in rooms that have them. Because 583 schools, different systems, different ages. In some cases, one section of the building has one system, another section has another system. So this was seen as a way of bringing that measure of comfort and, and, and security. But while awareness about the need to ventilate is growing, action is harder to measure. We reached out to more than two dozen school boards across the country. Of those who responded, most were working to improve air quality, including increasing outdoor air intake, upgrading filters, or using portable air cleaners in classrooms. A handful of boards said they had made no changes to their pre-pandemic ventilation standards or were unable to reply to CBC questions. So 8 to 13 percent of kids having these long-term disabilities. Which the unknowns worry parents and health professionals, especially in Alberta where cases are rising and restrictions are easing. Alberta is providing schools with $44 million to make ventilation improvements, but the province plans to stop testing, tracing and isolating COVID cases and to drop mandatory masking. Terrified and scared. I, it's, it's kind of tainting the start of kindergarten with all the changes here. Um, I, I just don't even know what to expect. 
Lindsay Kemp's five-year-old son, George, has had two heart transplants. It means his immune system is weaker and he's too young to be vaccinated. He desperately needs every safety measure. Right now, though, it's not clear if he will have any. There's many schools that have not up-to-date ventilation. They have no windows. They have windows that don't open. Um, they're jam-packed with kids. So with the airborne transmission, that's, that's a huge issue. And so if we're stopping the testing, tracing, and isolating, uh, as Alberta is, uh, and no masking, that's gonna be a, it's going to be high risk for George to attend school, and for others, not just George. Because he's vulnerable, Camp does have the option of keeping her son home. But she says that shouldn't be the default. You know, George is a strong, healthy child now, and he deserves to be in person with his peers, and he deserves to be kept safe. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's an uncontrolled experiment, and it's an uncontrolled experiment on kids. And, Siegel has had know, more than a few calls from worried parents. Saying, well, his advice? Keep the, raising the alarm. So what I really tell parents to do is ask the principal or the administrator, you know, hey, what are you doing? And so, you know, what are they doing in the high-risk environments? You know, gyms and physical education, wherever kids are eating. Those are all high-risk environments. So ask about them. The be main benefit of that is that, the, you know, the administrator learns that, oh, this is important to parents. So this is our kindergarten wing in this particular school. In Ottawa, parents helped drive airborne precautions. Even though there were barely any COVID cases in the board's schools last year, portable HEPA filters were brought into kindergarten classes. How much of this is about dealing with the, the feeling of people psychologically feeling safe? That's huge. It really is. Mental health has to be the number one priority. When we return in September, uh, I'm not so worried about literacy and numeracy recovery. I'm worried uh, about mental health. So we have to spend time letting everyone know they've been through trauma and we're supporting them in that area. And if they know the air quality has improved, that's going to make them feel safer about their learning environment. Feeling safe, it is a moving target. Playing it safe can seem that way too. And here especially comes down to doing nothing less than everything possible. Joanna Brumaliotis, CBC News, Ottawa. A Saskatchewan family is fighting a minor hockey association that has blocked their daughter from playing. You just break down, right? Like, you just come too emotional and you can't handle it anymore. Coming up, the disagreement that started in a change room but could end up in court and a little later in the show. So this is pretty much where we found the guns, right? Yeah, right there, yeah. A rope, a magnet, that's all it took for two guys to find historic artifacts at the bottom of a lake. Stay with us. Welcome back. It may feel too hot to talk hockey, but things have gotten very frosty between the family of a 12-year-old Saskatchewan girl and their local hockey association. Bonnie Allen now with a dressing room dispute that is now a human rights complaint. Like in so many small towns, hockey usually brings people together in Delmeny, Saskatchewan. Put some stink on it, Burke. But this past year, the Trehorn family became embroiled in a dispute so bitter that 12-year-old Berkeley Trehorn can never play minor hockey in her hometown ever again. She's been banned. And Berkeley and her dad Rod say it all traces back to the fact she's a girl. I kind of felt like really sad or like like I did like something wrong because they were blocking me from there. By there, she means the team dressing room, a source of problems for years. Like so many girls, Berkeley has played hockey with boys since she was five. When she turned 11, Hockey Canada's co-ed dressing room policy kicked in. The binding rules say girls and boys must change separately, but they're expected to come together in the same dressing room, fully dressed except for skates and helmet, 15 minutes before and after a practice or game. So for the past couple years, Berkeley has had to gear up in hallways, closets, bathrooms, even a furnace room. She felt very demeaned by that. Uh, I sat there in the room with her. Plus, she's. we've had situations where... Um, uh, grown men have just walked in on her because she's not actually in a dressing room. It's, it's, a, it's a, a utility closet. Well, I didn't really want to play anymore because 
like that's mainly like the whole part that I really wanted to be there was just like to have fun and me sitting by myself is not very fun. And then the pandemic hit. We felt finally um, she would be fully welcomed as part of the team and just be able to walk right in with her team as an equal. COVID-19 protocols required all players to get dressed at home. They could only arrive at the rink 15 minutes before ice time and had to be fully dressed except for skates, helmets and gloves. Berkeley's coaches and team manager agreed that she could be in the same room with her male teammates for those 15 minutes. But the Delmany Minor Hockey Association said no way. This COVID year was really difficult. Kelly McClintock oversees hockey for all of Saskatchewan. He says he was told boys on the team were uncomfortable, even though the policy allows Berkeley to be in the room. Maybe in theory, but there's a lot of dress rooms where, you know, the washrooms don't have any doors on them, etc. But that's not actually the case in Delmany. It all led to a flashpoint last October. Berkeley says a group of parents and board members physically blocked her from entering the dressing room. The volunteer board members here in Delmany who spoke to CBC News all settled on one main reason, that it's too risky to have unchaperoned boys in a dressing room with a girl even when everyone is fully dressed, that it could lead to bullying, sexual harassment, even assault. It might be an extreme case, but it could be a possibility, right? So again, you're just trying to protect everyone from, uh, from things that could happen. The Treyhorns say it's not their fault parents don't trust their boys. I was angry. I was upset. I cried. Um, uh, but it was only met with, I made a phone call to one of the board members, which the response was, I don't want to get involved. The Treyhorns demanded an apology to their daughter and more inclusion. When they didn't get it, they called a lawyer and filed a human rights complaint. The Treyhorns also refused to sign a code of conduct that prohibited them from speaking negatively about the board. We couldn't, in good faith, sign it knowing that we are going to speak negatively about the board at some point um, because we're taking them to human rights court. The toxic dispute prompted some board members to resign. In May, the Minor Hockey Association permanently released Berkeley. The reason? Multiple violations of our code of conduct by Berkeley's parents, including vulgar and threatening language. The couple denies threatening anyone, but admits they lost their tempers more than once. You just break down, right? Like, you just come too emotional. And you can't handle it anymore. Very challenging for volunteers and I feel sorry for them. The Saskatchewan Hockey Association general manager supports the decision to ban Berkeley from Delmany Hockey and stands behind the volunteers. They do an incredible job and they put up with an incredible amount of, uh, uh, of abuse. Uh, I know because I deal with a lot of verbal abuse and uh, for them uh, to put up with situations like that is extremely stressful and it's turned off a lot of people from even being involved in the game. The Human Rights Commission rejected the Treyhorns, citing insufficient evidence, but the family has reapplied with more documentation. Quit is not in our blood. The Treyhorns are resolute. They insist their daughter was discriminated against on the basis of sex. Sometimes it makes me angry. As for Berkeley, she feels caught in the middle, confused as to how things escalated to this point. They're just kind of being stupid, so... She misses her teammates, but will have to go elsewhere to play hockey. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Delmany, Saskatchewan. There is an incredible show in the sky this week. Comets are the dump trucks of space. Hawk McDonald makes the case for why you should stay up to watch the streaking lights. This is... And if you haven't already heard, there are new Jeopardy hosts. We'll tell you who got the coveted roles next. And now, here is the executive producer of Jeopardy, Mike Richards.
The great Johnny Gilbert, thank you very much. Welcome to Jeopardy. You know, we acknowledge... Well, that iconic opening will soon introduce Mike Richards as the new permanent host of Jeopardy. The executive producer will take over as host of the syndicated game show, replacing, of course, Alex Trebek. And Richards won't be the only one behind the famed podium once the new season kicks off. Making hot ice. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. <laughs> oh, nice one. <laughs> that is the Big Bang Theory actor and uh, holder of a doctorate, Maya Bialik. She will also host. She'll do the primetime shows along with a spin-off championship scheduled to air next year. The duo will begin their duties this fall. An annual cosmic light show is hitting its peak tonight and tomorrow night. The Perseid meteor shower is considered the best this year, according to NASA. The spectacle of flickering light draws an audience each year, especially in the northern hemisphere, where we have some pretty good views. Well, let's bring in Bob McDonald, the host of CBC's Quirks and Quarks. And Bob, I have never seen this meteor shower before. I've wondered oh, whether really? I should stay up late and, <laughs> and watch it. So you tell me, is it worth it? I think it's worth it, Ian, because it's a chance to see how fast the Earth moves through space. A meteor shower happens when our planet drives through a cloud of dust in space. Have you ever been driving along and a big dump truck goes by in the opposite direction and it throws up all that dust and dirt that you have to drive through and stones bounce off your windshield? Well, there are dump trucks in space. They're called comets. Comets leave trails of dust behind them as they go around the sun, and that cloud just stays in space for decades. And every August, we plow through one of those. So it's really the Earth that's moving through this cloud of dust. We forget about the fact that the Earth is moving really, really fast through space. We're doing 100,000 kilometers an hour, which is faster than our rockets. So when we run into this stuff, it hits our atmosphere and it flares up, it's vaporized. Now, most of these particles are very tiny. They're only the size of a grain of sand, but they'll flare up bright enough that you get a streak in the sky and it looks really cool. <laughs> Good news in Vancouver tonight, at least, is that we probably won't have any clouds, but basically where and when do I have to situate myself to get the best show? You need two things. You need a dark sky and you need to go out late at night because for North America, the peak is really after midnight. So you want to be out really late and get away from city lights the best way you can. Go to a park, get out of the city, get into the shadow of a building, look to the northeast and you'll see these streaks of light happen once every minute or two and uh, just keep your eyes open for a long, long time. Lay back and take your time. It's, it's worth the wait. All right, well, you are getting me excited about this, uh, so it'll be a spectacle, but there's a serious side to this as well, Bob. This is, uh, these showers are also a part of space debris that threatens satellites and the International Space Station, especially those big solar panels, those wings that stick out. They can be punctured by these things. So if a meteor shower is intense, they're warned to turn those panels edge on so that there'll be minimum damage. So not only will there be people on the ground watching this meteor shower tonight, Ian, there'll be people in space keeping an eye out as well. All right, Bob, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Ian. I like when you looked down and found a, you know, model of Earth. Uh, a pair of treasure hunters found a surprising haul at the bottom of Lake Ontario. It's so amazing, dude. Oh my God, I found three guns? Whoa, how their pandemic hobby turned into an artifact hunt. That's next, in our moment. This is an old gun pulled up out of that lake. To pass the time during the pandemic, these two Toronto friends took up magnet fishing and documented their hobby on YouTube. When they dropped those magnets into the lake, they mostly expected to pick up pop cans and bottle caps. What they didn't expect was to come across discarded knives and rifles from the 1950s. They call themselves the Sludge Pirates, and their impressive catch is our moment. I just got a call one day from, from Evan, and he sent me uh, sort of a goofy video about magnet fishing. I checked it out, thought it was stupid, thought it was funny, thought it was interesting. You then said, hey, can we get the magnets? We tried them out for the first time, and you caught a spoon. I caught a spoon, <laughs> it was the most exciting thing in the world. <laughs> and um, as soon as we did it, we were hooked. And I said, we're just a couple of sludge pirates. And then Neil said, That'd be a good name for a show. We were like, well, hey, let's let's start shooting these things yeah. and, and put them up and maybe people might find them interesting. No way. Oh, One of the guns he got in particular was like pre-World War II. I got a knife. It was made by a knife smith in northern Mexico. And he produced fighting knives for Vietnam soldiers between 1950s to 1970. What drew, drew us in was 
the, the mystery of it. We were pulling up something we think is rebar or think is garbage, and then it ends up being a 150-year-old knife. In this case here, you know, rifles. You'll be happy to know that when they pulled out those rifles, this being Canada and all, people called the police and said there are a couple of guys there who are holding rifles uh, at the edge of Lake Ontario. So the police came, took the rifles, they'll check it all out and eventually uh, give it back to the sludge pirates. By the way, their investment for this was like, I don't know, $120. And those magnets, just in case you're interested, can apparently lift up 1,300 pounds of metal on each side. Who knew? That is a national for August 11th. Good night.